Hello, um, today I'm talking about C2, C2 infrastructure, and uh, this is going to be just a high level overview of what a command and control server is, where you can get them, what they're used for, all that stuff. Um, but it's going to be the start of um, a couple of videos where I'm going to go through and show you how to set one up. Uh, I'm going to show you how to set up a redirector. I'm going to show you what the um, detections look like whenever they're run using Elasticstack and probably some Tines integrations there as well. Um, I'm also going to show you how to use Tines as well to, um, to automate some of the attack side of things. So if you're a red team or offensive security, I'm going to do videos on showing how to use Tines to do that. And I'm also going um, to hopefully uh, at the end do basically a mock purple team exercise using something like Caldera and actually run through the sort of whole process of getting the intel to say, okay, this is the test that the blue team want us to do. Running through that, setting that up in Caldera, I'll also go through and show how to set up the Caldera, Caldera and, and how to get that configed and set up. Um, and then running through the exercise and what that looks like from the blue team and how they work together. That's going to be the end of it. Um, and these videos will be out once a month as per usual. I'm pre-recording them all mostly now. So if you have any questions, anything like that, put them in the comments. Um, they may not be answered by the next video, but I'll be active in the comments and, and replying to things. But because I'm sort of batch doing these videos and just scheduling them, um, I may not answer your questions or if you have any advice or tips or anything like that, that you've noticed in any exercises you have done, um, you may notice a delay in me, in me picking those up. But for this one, I just wanted to talk at a high level as to what a C2 is, a command and control. Some of you may have heard of Cobalt Strike. It's sort of the common one that hacking groups use at the minute um, it's starting to fall out of favor a little bit it's very expensive from a a legal side like if me as a red team or purple team or whatever wanted to use it um, it's expensive um, and there's plenty of free and open source variants out there and there's pros and cons with this the downside is the open source ones are fingerprinted to hell so you need to do some obfuscation yourself so that they don't get caught so to start, um, what actually is a C2? So a command and control is a way of um, remotely managing lots of sessions with victim machines, vic machines that have been compromised. You can send commands through them. Um, you can uh, manage how many you've got. You can adjust values on the sleeps and things like that. It's, it's sort of like a centralized way of managing your attack. And it comes in a lot of different flavors um, and there's lots of different ways to do them but generally speaking you will have a beacon is what it's called and this is a pre-compiled file or maybe some shell code or whatever it may be and you run this on the victim machine or you get the victim to run this in some way shape or form and what happens is it then calls back to the beacon so the connection is on the uh, victim machine and then it calls back out to the outside world, out to the internet, to your C2 infrastructure. And this is a couple of benefits from an attacker perspective. Um, because it's an outbound connection, most uh, companies, most networks will have rules to allow connections to go outbound. So 80 and 443 are common examples. They are HTTP, HTTPS. It's the internet, okay? Every company in the world is going to allow that outbound. And so if we have a beacon that is calling out on port 443, to our C2 that we know that's going to be allowed. And if we use HTTPS, it's even encrypted, it makes it harder for the attackers, or sorry, for the defenders to see, it makes it easier for us to hide in the network. And the beacon itself isn't a constant connection. So um, I'm sure some of you, if you've done any CTFs or you've done any security learning, um, you'll know about a reverse shell. And same idea, it's a connection from the victim machine out to a machine that you control. Um, that the attacker controls, but it is it is an interactive shell. It is a session just as if you were um, SSH'd onto the box and you can go and type commands a bit like the window that we have here. You know, we could type, yeah, my, it's interactive, it's there. The problem with that is that that is very noisy from a network perspective. It's very easy to spot and a lot of EDRs and intrusion detection systems will pick up on this. Um, so having that constant connection just means that for as long as your hands on the keyboard, um, you have potential to get caught. With a beacon, however, it calls out and gets commands. So it will send out to the C2 server and it will say, hey, have you got any commands for any run? On the C2, there will be basically a queue of commands ready. And it will say, yes, I've got these commands for you to run. Here you go. The beacon will then take those commands, 
run them and then send the response back up but it doesn't call back constantly you can set how often it calls back so usually you would have multiple um uh, multiple beacons running throughout the network all with different sleeps so you would have one that maybe calls back every five minutes to get a command you might have one that maybe only calls back once a day and you maybe have one that only calls back uh, you know every few hours or something you, you would stagger them out so that if one gets caught it's not always um going to be the case that all of them get caught because it means the traffic is sort of hidden and blends in a little bit better so that's a broad overview of what ac2 is um i've got one up here this is a uh, sliver which is an open source one there's lots of really good documentation on it um it, it's a really cool one to use so i highly recommend it i'll do a separate video on how to install it and if you want to have a play around it's definitely a good one to to check out and these tools are used not just by attackers obviously attackers use tools like this all the time but it's also used by offensive security professionals so whether you are purple teamer red teamer pen tester whatever it may be um you know if you want to learn the offensive side of it better these are great tools to get into and start having um, having a play around with but they're also very useful for a blue teamer so someone on the defensive side if they want to come in and learn how these things actually operate because that can make it a lot easier whenever you're looking through logs actually go okay well that traffic looks like a beacon and i can tell that because you know i've set one up i've played with it i know what they look like i sort of get the feel of how they run and um, so definitely useful for anyone in cybersecurity to have a go with and and play about with and um, for this video i am i am just going to um show very quickly and um, sort of generating a beacon it detonating and, and sort of what that looks like and sending commands um, I'll do more in-depth videos as we go. Um, and with that uh, flow that I talked about of, you know, we're going to, um, or over the course of the next few videos, we're going to set up C2s, we're going to set up redirectors. I'll, I'll talk more about them later. Um, we're going to set up um, or see the blue team side, or we're going to run a purple team pool exercise. I'll maybe get some help with that from a, a dear friend and colleague um who has been hacking things for a lot longer than me and um, so maybe i might be able to get a little bit of collaboration with him um on the purple side we'll we'll see how that goes um and yeah so that that's the structure of the videos if anyone has any ideas of what else you'd want to see from like a um we'll, we'll take the stance of a red team operation okay um for the sort of structure that we'll build um is there anything you would want to see anything you think that would be cool to um to to cover and certainly see if we can cover it so i've i've went into the sliver um command line here and we have a load of commands in here again not going to go through them all in this one we just want to keep it high level but the key components of a um of a connection that we want to make we need um a couple of things we obviously need the beacon so we need the um the actual compiled binary that's going to run and then we also need a listener so if you're familiar with reverse shells you'll know that you need to set up a netcat listener it's usually like netcat dash lnbp and then the port like a thousand whatever you need to set that up and then that listens for a connection coming in we need to do the same thing with a with a c2 and we can do this a couple of ways you can actually see in here we've got http https and we can start an http listener start an https listener we can also start an mtls listener and um, mtls is the one i'm going to use it's what um sliver recommend it's sort of their recommended listener and beacon format but you can do anything you want http https doesn't really matter so how do we generate um or sorry how do we start the listener and it's very easy mtls there we go we now have a listener and actually we have a a beacon already connected um that was uh, that was unintentional um that was i was testing beforehand so good to know my other beacon is still alive but we'll ignore that for now um but if i type jobs uh jobs we can see we've got a listener here on port uh 800 or 8888 so now we need to generate a payload and to do this we can do generate uh, beacon we need to tell it the type which we obviously started an mtls listener so we uh, need to tell it that that's the type that we want to use and um, we then need to give an ip address 
and in this case you give the IP address of the C2 server or the server that you're wanting this beacon to connect to. If you're using redirectors, this will be slightly different. So um, don't worry about that for now. Um, <laughs> all my beacons are kicking off here now. Um, don't worry about that for now. But in this case, uh, for what we're doing, we just want to generate it for the um, the C2 server that we're using. So in this case, it's 192.168.1.188, I want to say. Uh, 188, yeah. And then we want to tell it the OS. And in this case, I'm going to put it on a Windows machine. But um, Sliver is all, um, or compiles its binaries with Golang. So it supports pretty much all operating systems that Golang supports. And you just put it in here. So if you want it Mac, you can put in uh, Mac, Linux, whatever. And you can also do architecture. And it does support ARM. Uh, in, uh, ARM architecture, so even Apple Silicon, you can create beacon implants for. But in this case, we're going to create one here for a Windows. I'm going to start this. And um, it's going to run through and compile. Now, this takes a little bit of time. So we're going to give it a second and let it compile. Okay, and the, uh, the implant is now there, or it's generated. It can take a while to generate, just it depends on um, how beefy your sliver machine is. It can run on basically anything, but just the compile time can take a little bit, a little bit of time. Um, and so you can see here, it saved it to home grant, and then it's given it a a random name, and it's generated an exe for us. So now we need to take this and put it onto the victim machine. Now, if you were doing this in a a exercise, a red team exercise, you'd probably have, um, unless you're doing initial access as well, you'd probably have a trusted agent who would then run the the payload for you. Um, if you're doing initial access, then it's a whole plethora of ways that you'll be trying to get in. Um, but ultimately, now we want to run this on the victim machine. And in this case, I have a a web server also running on this um, on the sliver C2. It's just using the Python basic HTTP. And if I show here and refresh this, uh, we can see here broad hobby is in there hopefully you can see that okay but i can download that exe from there and if i click on it windows complains will run anyway and if we go back here you can see the beacon has called back home now on the windows machine on the victim lab that i have um i have disabled all the antivirus uh, windows defender will pick this out any day of the week. In fact, pretty much all antivirus systems will pick this up very, very quickly. Um, so you will have to disable uh, Defender if you want, um, if you're wanting to run this. Um, we'll show obfuscation, all that stuff in a, in a later video. So how do you actually interact with it? Well, if I do beacons, you can see we have three in here. So um, two of which are the ones that uh, triggered whenever I first span this up. They were um, hangups from when I was testing. You can see here we've got um, obviously the information, in the implant, how the connections uh, done, whether it's through HTTPS, whatever. In this case, obviously MTLS. Um, the host name, the username of the uh, the account that you're on. So whoever, um, whichever account you have on the victim machine, uh, is shown there. Architecture, and then the last check in, next check in. So this just shows, um, if you remember I said about the beacons calling out and getting commands, this is basically um, where it's sort of showing how often has it called in. Now, if we want to interact with one of these, you can copy this and we go use and then the ID. And you can see we're now in, uh, in this uh, beacon. So now we can uh, run commands and these commands aren't going to be instant as I said it's polling so let's say if I do an ls it will be tasked and uh, if I say let's do a couple of these and then I go uh, tasks we can see that these tasks are pending so they're waiting to be sent and they're sent in uh, first in first out so the first command that I sent will be the first one that goes and if we just monitor this, uh, we should see these starting to come through. 
Okay, and there we can see they've uh, they've now went completed. Um, and it does auto uh, give you the results back. Um, but if you ever wanted to see the uh, results of an old command, you can do uh, tasks fetch, and then the ID, and then it will give you the the results of that of that command again. But obviously, it will just populate once the results start coming in. And you can see the um, the re uh, the output of that ls. We've got it in here of all of the files that were in that download folder, and that's it. That's it's basically a C2 in a nutshell. As I say, I'm going to do um, other videos on how to install Sliver. It's very, very easy. Um, what redirectors are, how we install them, um, running engagements, using things like Caldera as well. We'll also go into obfuscation, how to actually hide all this. Um, so yeah, if you have any um, uh, anything that you want to see or know about, put it in the comments and we'll certainly, uh, we'll certainly try and make that happen. Cheers.